Uh, so I just want to say thank you to everyone that contributed today to bring us some content. Thank you. Um, these events are really a collaboration. It's not just one person. Um, so today is our <clears throat> sixth annual Zeitgeist Day. Z Day is a global effort uh, where people worldwide take action uh, to impact and hopefully update our values and thinking within the current socioeconomic system in which we all live. Um, as everyone now knows, my name is Jason Lord, and I coordinate chapters for the movement in California. Um, many of them, and we have San Diego chapter up here today representing who brought their circular city model on the display outside, uh, who also did a similar kind of an event uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so this is happening all over the world. And the title of my presentation today is Economic Inequality and Public Health. Uh, I chose this topic because part of the ongoing social transition that we are all currently in is understanding how well we're doing as a species and what it is that really matters with how we measure our success. And this is better understood in terms of health rather than in terms of economics. The word equality is subject to the same semantic problems like the word freedom or democracy are, but everyone tends to interpret uh, these words in a slightly different way as to what they mean or in how we may see ourselves as equal or not equal to each other, especially say by perhaps race, creed, or social class. So I want to spend a few minutes today looking at inequality in its economic form and present how there is a technical relationship when measuring our health that changes how we think about it. In our recently, uh, recently published book, The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, there is a densely sourced chapter on the subject of public health. This is a primer uh, to understanding what we mean when we say the word health. And in short, what is argued in this section is how modern social structures, values, and practices have deviated away from or are ignorant of what true societal health means, where most measures of prosperity or social integrity are equated to economic baselines. You've heard this, like GDP or uh, employment figures. Uh, these measures tell us very little about true human well-being and prosperity since they are decoupled from the actual life support system, the earth, our resources, our environment, our physiology, our mental health, and the life ground needs that we all share. The term public health is a medical classification, usually defined as the approach to medicine that is concerned with the health of the community as a whole. In our media, uh, in our you know, mass public media today, uh, public health is often concerned with cost and with policy making, and they're focused on the rates of success in treating a disease without examining the causal system relationships themselves. Our aim is to extend this context of health out to all aspects of our lives, including our physiological health, our mental health, as well as our environment. The thesis I wish to put forth here is the significant negative impact from our economic practices that deteriorate our well-being, especially in regards to stress, mental illness, and rates of disease. Economic inequality is known as the difference in a person's financial wealth uh, or income is related through social status or class. These differences of income are the measure of how stratified a society is in its class hierarchy. And by examining how these factors impact us will lead us, lead us to discovering some important system relationships to the levels of disease and illness experienced within the population. I'll use the term uh, inequality in referring to income inequality among individuals and groups within a society. This inequality also manifests itself uh, as unequal access to life ground needs, such as food, clean air, water, shelter, education, and nutrition. Um, human beings have lived in many kinds of societies, including uh, egalitarian hunting and gathering societies to the most brutal of dictatorships. Evidence shows that our early human ancestors, which predate the Neolithic revolution of nearly 10,000 years ago, did not live in a continuous state of conflict and scarcity. Uh, this less conflicting social value has been the longest running behavioral mode of human existence, regardless of how fixed you may see unwanted behaviors in conflict today. These pre-agricultural societies, though restrictive in their own ways, lived within the carrying capacities of their environment for the majority of human existence and reflected this balance by having non-competitive social structures. The current market-based democracies do not exemplify our egalitarian past or the dictatorial structures of recent history. But what we can learn from is observing the differences of how economically stratified societies were. For example, when greater income inequality is measured, we see the social distances increase from one socioeconomic group to the next. 
and social stratification becomes more important to understanding the levels of health and well-being of everyone in the group. And when it comes to the monetary economics and social stratification, what has been well established over these past several years of TZM awareness activism is that the greatest destroyer of our environmental integrity, the greatest source of waste, depletion of our natural resources, and the purveyor of violence and war, crime, poverty, personal neuroses and mental disorders, along with also being the greatest source of paralysis, stopping us from moving forward into new methodologies for sustainable practices, is not some corrupt government or a rogue corporation or just a flaw of human nature, but rather the economic system itself, which is producing these system outcomes that are latent within its structure. So whichever descriptor you wish to use, the free market or the monetary system, uh, these are the causal mechanisms of most of the negative social outcomes that we suffer today. One attribute of this causal mechanism is how we live in a world measured by money sequences, where how well we're doing as a society is generally measured through economic variables, you know, the Dow, the stock market, or some form of economic growth, often disregarding the real levels of anxiety and illness within the society itself. And while, this, uh, and while the reality of these problems persist, the Zeitgeist Movement advocates that it doesn't have to be this way, that it is possible to design in access to health and human needs and reverse the trends of increasing cancer rates, criminal behavior, and social stress. The circumstances in which we live and work are also major influences on our health. One way you can see this is in the varying levels of disease and illness between people in different social groups. Inequality reflects how hierarchical societies are, manifesting a social gradient in health, which is the phenomena found throughout the industrialized world. As we look at social stratification, there is a relationship to inequality and the rates of illness throughout the entire socioeconomic pyramid, not just the people at the bottom. So let's take a look at an example to this gradient to health. When we look at major causes of death globally, clear differences exist based on the economic state of a region. Shown here in red and orange, we see the fact that cancers are more common in high-income society versus low-income societies across the globe. In comparison, diarrheal diseases uh, are more common in low-income society and is a leading cause of child mortality worldwide mostly as a result from contaminated food and water sources, which are technically obsolete problems, yet are still current day outcomes in our mon monetary-based value system, manifesting as extreme poverty. Um, it's important to note that being rich does not immune you to these types of prevalent diseases inside of a society in which you live. No matter your social class, you will not be immune to the projected 30% rise in cancer rates by 2030. I bring this up because there is a common myth that the gradient of health in industrialized societies is simply a matter of poor health for the disadvantaged, the people at the bottom, and good health for everyone else. Creating an us versus them psychology between the rich and the poor when you look at the health gap. And it is because of this myth that health policy is commonly focused on organizing and funding health services. And you can see how this has played out with the now mandatory purchasing of health insurance in the United States. Another focus of our media's attention to health is the ongoing concern with genetics, where the prevention of major chronic diseases tends to focus on trying to find a genetic predisposition for a disease, laying the groundwork to perpetuate some dark age assumptions, assumptions in our social landscape. This genetic assumption makes it easy to justify swelling prison populations because of bad genes or bad blood or it's just human nature. Such views overlook the relationship between the rates of crime, types of crime, and the environment in which that crime exists, often creating a distorted view of causality regarding aberrant behavior. Locking people up indefinitely will do little to address a social system that breeds corruption through its structural components of debt, consumption, the need to cut costs, the need to maximize profits, exercise differential advantage through competition-based mindset, and enforce restricted access to life needs through private ownership. When problems are understood as systemic, a new empathy emerges from placing much of the existing criminal justice system in the context of public health. This is why our analysis of the health of a society has to stop being based on abstract measures such as gross domestic product, the stock market, consumer price index, or other commonly referenced economic measures used to claim, used to claim that society is improving. 
Instead, we want to examine things that actually have a physical referent, such as rates of disease, poverty, social capital and trust, life expectancy, literacy rates, prison population, uh, et cetera, et cetera. A key factor related to what we looked at so far is the amount of psychological stress that is generated within our system. This is important because it's more common to focus on the individual byproducts of income inequality uh, as isolated problems in and of themselves. But statistically, what is found is that the more income inequality exists in a society, the more health problems that occur in both the upper and lower classes throughout the industrialized world. Um, the amount of psychological stress, uh, or also known as psychosocial stress, generated by the degree of social uh, stratification affects everyone. Whether it be the stress of losing one's job, lack of purchasing power, having to submit to employment, or having to suffer a hostile corporate takeover, uh, there is a relationship between these stressors, your health, and the amount of inequality that exists around you. Another condition worth noting is how it's financially good for the market to have mandated health fees and premiums on everyone. Uh, to have people consume more pharmaceuticals or to service increasing cancer rates, it's a business, and profit is the primary driver. So your well-being will always be second to the profit motive. And as social stressors increase, people are left to find ways to manage the psychological stress generated by the world around them. Meanwhile, we're bombarded with advertising for goods and services in which billions of dollars are made uh, from the ongoing consumption of health products, drugs, and lifestyles. What I want to show you next are some examples of outcomes that inequality on populations of affluent societies around the world have. Thanks to the work of uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett of the UK in the book called The Spirit Level, these relationships can now be seen. Um, I'll apologize in advance if I go too quick through some of these following charts, but just so you know, everything can easily be found online um, uh, today. Uh, as a visual reference, uh, when you you'll see a red regression line in some of this stuff. Uh, if it slants downward, it's showing that the economic uh, or the social outcome is less common with greater inequality. And if the re regression line slopes upward, it's showing um, that the social outcome is more common with greater inequality. Uh, so uh, once a country has moved past basic subsistence and works in the arena of economic uh, affluence, the following trends occur. Mental illness is more common in more unequal countries. As you can see in this chart, the US leading the sample group in both mental illness and income inequality, while Japan with the lowest income inequality has the least amount of mental illness. Life expectancy, longer in more equal countries. Uh, drug use, more common in more unequal countries. In this chart, we see the United States as having the highest level of inequality um, while also being within the top four countries with the most illegal drug use. Levels of trust, higher in, e in more equal countries. You could also refer to this as social capital, uh, which can be defined as the spirit and willingness of people to engage in collective civic activity. Uh, this chart reflects how those that feel they can trust one another are much more common in equal societies. Educational scores, higher in more equal countries. Not only do less equal countries have worse educational attainment, kids are more likely to drop out of school as well. Homicide rates, higher in more unequal countries. Just the USA is just off the chart on that one. <laughs> rates of imprisonment, higher in more unequal countries. Here we see the, uh, that the more unequal a country is, the more people are in prison. Uh, and this doesn't just relate to crime rates, uh, which are more prevalent in unequal societies, but there is a noticeable difference in the punitive uh, attitudes towards cr crime in a society. So said another way, the more unequal a society is, uh, the harsher the punishments are given for an offense, uh, and the more people are put into prison for longer period times uh, than in more equal countries. Infant mortality, higher in more unequal countries. Uh, obesity, higher in more unequal countries. And finally, here's a summation of the outcomes we just saw. This chart is a short index of outcomes that increase with inequality. That's economic inequality. 
And as you can see, the United States with its high levels of stratification is again <laughs> number one. So. <laughs> Uh, the, the contrast between material success and social failure in rich countries is an indicator that it's time for us to reorient our world view. Uh, in a system where monetary gain is a priority over human well-being, uh, we are not going to see any real significant change while this system runs its course. Rather, we will most likely suffer from increases in environmental and psychosocial stress as we struggle to get by. So we find a changing view of human health that calls for a new social imperative where measures of well-being and happiness are no longer to, or found to no longer rise with economic growth and diminish with greater inequality or simply stated, greater economic equality equals increased well-being for everyone. If we want to achieve improvements in the areas of life that matter, our attention needs to shift from using abstract monetary measures and look towards ways of improving the psychological and physical well-being of people using the best information that we have available. This understanding is part of why the Zeitgeist Movement advocates a natural law resource-based economic model, a social system that, at its core, is concerned with the health and well-being of people and our environmental integrity. A resource-based economic model takes into account the fundamental building blocks of society and the basic mechanisms required to maintain our emotional, intellectual, and physical well-being. All social systems, regardless of political philosophy, religious beliefs, traditions, or customs, ultimately depend upon natural resources. And it's why this fundamental point needs the attention it demands. This common basis of survival, which the Zeitgeist Movement acknowledges, is not a religion or a political philosophy. Our well-being is based on how well we organize our socioeconomic system, the methods we use to problem solve, and how we manage the use of our Earth's resources. Our Earth system is the fundamental life referent, and for any social philosophy that does not heed this referent, it is simply unworkable. If you'd like to find out more, there are many materials here on our tables and also free online uh, on the internet. Uh, this concludes my talk today. I hope you become part of the movement, and I thank you for your time. Yeah.